2004, a new year. And today we're interviewing uh, Mr. William A. Tilson. And this interview is being done by the Ashby Historical Society, participating in the United States Veterans History Project, the project in which our veterans have been asked to share their stories while they were in the armed services. The tapes are going to be kept here in Ashby and are going to be listed and cataloged in the Library of Congress for these interviews that are being done all over the country. <clears throat> Mr. Tilson, uh, you have lived in Ashby most all your life. And I Majority think of it. You said that uh, you went to every grade in school right here in this, this building. building. We're in the Lyman building where the interview is being done. So. <clears throat> You were born probably in Fitchburg. in Fitchburg, and your parents were here, or were you here, were your parents My, my parents were in Fitchburg at the time, shortly afterwards we moved to Ashby on turn by Grover. Okay, so this has been home. <clears throat> um, when, uh, so you went into the service from here, yes. you were living here at the time. Yes. And. Uh, you chose what service? Navy. The Navy. So you enlisted? I enlisted. I volunteered enlistment because I was going to be drafted anyway. Okay. And I liked the Navy. My brother was in the Navy. My uncle was in the Navy. So I chose the Navy. And you would have been how old? 18? Let's see. 1948. I was born in 1928. So that's 20 years. You were 20. 20. Okay. So you were a little older than some of them that had to choose. Were you married at the time? No. No. And you were living at home probably? Yes. Uh, you say you picked that service branch because your brother was in the Navy and uh, where was he? He was in World War II and he was actually, he was uh, on board a, a troop ship and he was over in the Philippines uh -huh. and he got out I'm going to say in 44, but I can't give you that exact date. Right, okay, so, and uh, he was quite a Navy man, and you decided to, to follow him. Any of other members of your family in the service? Well, uncles and cousins and stuff like that. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, my brother and I and my family were only the two of us, so. Right. So where did you go to boot camp? Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Illinois, uh -huh. Chicago. Anything particular about that? Uh, what did they do? Did you, were you on ship on the lakes? Is that what? No, that just, there was a big base out there where they did the training for service in the Navy for whatever you're going to do. It was just, everybody went to Great Lakes. It was a huge base. And there was nothing exciting that happened out there. And then where did you go? From there to Alameda, California for further uh, assignments wherever they wanted us, so we didn't know where we were going. They just shipped us out there, and we stayed there very few days, and then we went and bought the ship that brought us to Sand Point at the end of Puget Sound in the state of Washington. From there, we Be went... Be sure to speak up, please, Mr. Tilson, so that the mic fixes you up. Because the heater's running now, I want you to just be sure you... All right, from uh, Sand Point in the state of Washington, they shipped us up to Whidbey Island for general duty on just... I think to use us, and then they uh, they needed some uh, people out on this uh, base out in Cooley, which is still off of the state of Washington. It was a, in the Indian Territory, and we had to more or less stay on the base because we were not weren't supposed to mingle with any of the people that lived at Whidbey Island. What we always did there was general maintenance work at the base because that during World War II that was a base where the planes landed before they went onto a carrier, off from a carrier, they came back to that and were sent different ways from there, but we were there to mow the lawn, and it was wonderful duty, though. We were kind of free, we had the best food we could get, and you didn't have any real regulations, so it was, it was interesting to stay there. We weren't too long, two or three months like that. Uh -huh. From there, they shipped us to ADAC, Alaska, and the Lucians, and we were shipped there because they were decommissioning the squadron, the Navy squadron up there. The Navy was on the base during World War II, and now the Navy was going out in the Air Force and the Marines were going to take over, so we were shipped there to help pack up everything from, and that's where the government waste centers 
into everybody's story. But from there I went to Gavin's Field in Texas, and I remember my rest of my duty. I was there probably two years, something along about that. I can't give you the, I'd have to look up all that information. But that, I landed in a real soft position there. Somehow I got chosen to be working in what they call the OD's office at the Officer of the day, everybody that checked in or out had to go through that. And from there, you either give them directions what they wanted to find out. And that was, I stayed there the whole time. While I was in the Navy, I did get married in 19, oh, you did? 1951. I came home and married a girl I had known from, well, my, we always kid myself, my, my mother in law and my mother were great friends, so at a real, when we were babies, we, you knew each other we knew each other from way up, and so joined to the same church, the same youth groups. We got to know each other even closer, and we ended up getting married in 51 while I was still in the Navy. I, I came home, and she had everything prepared. It was a hurry-up wedding to get everything done. Was, she had it all done, and I was able to stay home for a short period of time. I went back to Cabinetsville, Texas, and halfway through that year of 51, she flew down, and we visited there, and in 1952, I arrived back home, and I think I left the Navy on my birthday, October 6, 1952. <laughs> I think you went in on your birthday and out on out your birthday. birthday. That, that's quite but I didn't get married on, that. I didn't get married on my birthday. We got married one week later, on oh. October 13. <laughs> so you uh, remember it well. We haven't interviewed very many Navy people. I believe we only have one other uh, Navy person oh, yeah. uh, here that we've interviewed. I was just wondering what the difference in the boot camp uh, and the training is. Apparently, you you didn't do a lot of work on the ship. You're, no. You were mostly in basis. We were just sent on ship. They wanted to put us on a ship so we know what a ship looked like. Right. Apparently, I can't I can't <laughs> confirm that. But that's we didn't do any work on the ship. We were all we stayed there in, in the place where they bunked down and. We were able to go up on deck and things like that, and half the guys were sick because the seas were so rough. So it wasn't a pleasant trip. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested, you said on uh, Puget that you were not allowed to mingle with the Indians? When we were on Puliu. Oh, Puliu. Yeah, that was an actual Indian territory. And if we did go into town or anything like that, we had to make sure we went in with four people at a time. And we were not, I didn't, myself, but we were not allowed to buy the Indians any liquored at all. Oh, yes. So the regulations out there were strict, but on base it was a piece of cake, if you want to use that expression. Uh -huh. But it was enjoyable, too. So, uh, now let's go to Texas. What, uh, what period of time was this uh, during the Korean War? How, would, how does this work out? Well, I'd say it's almost like in the, in the middle of the Korean War. I mean, we were all subject to change, at, you know, at, at places of where we were based or anything on account of the Korean War. They let us know that, and we were so just we were subject to call. We were subject to call anywhere at any time. Everybody was. It was just you just stayed one place. And I happened to get a cushy job. That's good. Now. The camp, I don't know where this base is. Was it on the uh, ocean or on the shore? It's on the, the Gulf coast, or? Corpus Christi, Texas. Which is on the Gulf? Which is right on the Gulf. It's below San Antonio, uh, quite a ways from Dallas, uh, south of Galveston. It was close to the Mexican border. It's a huge base. Okay. But it was, it was naval, naval air. Every place I went was naval air. Stations. Oh. So I don't know how I got into that, but it's every base I was on was naval air. Even Alameda, California, would actually was Navy. Sandpoint was air. Uh, Whidbey Island wasn't, and ADAC was naval air station, but they were breaking it up and going to let the Army and uh, Marines take it over. Well, did the carriers come in? Is that where no, either of these no, places? No, the Air planes would fly to a carrier and. The, planes coming from a carrier would come back into one of these bases. Okay. So it was almost, sometimes it was almost called a refueling stop because the planes didn't go as far as what they do today. That's true. Different kind of planes too, weren't they? Uh, <clears throat> well, let's see. Why don't you tell us a few of your things that stand out in your... Uh, did 
did you make any long-term friends or? I made a couple of friends. One lived in Rochester, New Hampshire, and my daughter lived in Rochester, New Hampshire for quite a long time, and I tried to contact by the, na the man's name was Byrd, B-Y-R-D, and I called a couple of names in the book that were there, B-Y-R-D, they had no recollection of that person. I had a real good friend in Texas that then when he got out of the Navy, he lived in Minnesota, and uh, I had contact with him. He came out here and visited me two or three different times. And then about two years ago, I got a letter from, I found out he had, was real sick with cancer, and his aunt, he had mother and father, he was either divorced or separated, whatever, but he lived with his aunt. His aunt called and said he had passed away from a heart attack, so. But I, I was his best man when he got married. Well, he was in the Navy, and I was real good friends with him. I had another friend that was lived in uh, Pennsylvania, and we corresponded shortly after we got out of the service. But then that one of those things you do—you don't keep it up; you just it dissolved. And I don't know if he's still there, if he's still living. Yeah. Well, one of the questions we usually ask is, "How did you stay in touch with your family?" But I'm sure you and your Prospective wife stayed in touch letters very and, much so. Letters and telephone. <laughs> letters and telephone. My mother and father and my aunt drove down to Texas to visit me while I was in Texas also. Oh, did they? So they just took that trip down and they enjoyed it very much. They met this friend that I was real friendly with. He was Finnish and we set up where they were going to stay in a motel down there and we had coffee ready for them because the Finns are great for coffee and they thought that was something out of this world that we remember to have coffee for them. <laughs> and they enjoyed their visit. They didn't stay that long, but they drove down. It was a vacation time for them. They left it. And my wife, when she came to visit me, she flew down. And she had uh, a rough trip coming down, not to air or anything like that, but on account of the war and gas and all that stuff, she had to. It was a real long trip to get to Texas. I, I don't forget how many hours it was, but it was long. She had a lot of stops, probably. A lot of stops <laughs> and go around about here, go around about there. Uh, she Probably was down, yeah. we stayed together there. They, by that good job that I had on the base, they allowed me to have a lot of extra time off without taking what they call leave time. So I was able to leave the base at uh, during the night time, during after the shift was over during the day at 5 o'clock, I was able to leave the base every day, So which a lot of people didn't, but I happened to be in a place where I could do it. Good. Kind of a second honeymoon, probably. Almost. <laughs> the first honeymoon was very short. Uh, yes. Of, being married, we went, we, I think all we did was drive to Washington, D.C. and back, and that's about it. Yeah. I stepped out of the room. Did you cover the part about, now, did, did you serve as Tilson? No, Tealy Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, so let's, why don't we go back to that? Uh, we've interviewed, there have been a number of Finnish people from Ashby that were in the service, and I think that stands very, very highly as, recognition and uh, you did mention that uh, you were finished and uh, as you said how did you you were in the service as Telico. Telico. Well, one of the things that I always joked about that wasn't why we changed our name either but well I had the name Telicolor in the service that go to what they call a mustard they take a roll call of all the names like that and they'd pass over my name and then they'd off the guy would that more would just but he did it all the time he'd say and you too. <laughs> I don't want to pronounce that name, right? <laughs> well, he was Polish and he had a hard job with it. But then when I got out of the service, uh, we always had a hard job. There was others going to change their name, but my father kind of felt hurt that we wanted to change their name. But there and again, now my father did not use the name Tillicola when he went to school. But he didn't like the idea we were going to change it. And we arrived at Tilson by boarding son of Tillicola. Very nice. So it didn't have any real connection, but it, we felt that was a good way to change it. So, were your parents first-generation immigrants, or my mother was? Your mother, my father was, was mostly Ashby. Uh -huh. Lived over, they lived on the farm over uh, on uh, Foster Road, just below. I don't know if you know, remember who Acer Allen was, the Allen yeah. resident, just down from that and across the street, the big farmhouse where my grandfather lived. My grandfather built all the stone walls that you would see by Asa Allen's house. There's, they're falling apart a little bit, but they were nice square, and he did built most of them. And of course, he had to use a horse and a stone carrier. Do you know when he came? <coughs> no, I can't. Yeah. 
just interesting. I'd have to see her again. I've never gone through it. We've got a book at home yeah. to fill out, but yeah. it's one of those things where we'll do it tomorrow. Thank you. I was kind of chasing a rabbit with the immigration thing, but I was just curious. Yeah. My mother came over from Finland. She was born in Finland. Uh -huh. Well, while we're talking about families, too, as uh, we mentioned, your mother-in-law, your wife's mother, was a holder of the Boston Post cane yes. for a number of yes. years, and she just died this past year at age? 99 and 8 months. 99 and 8 months, almost 100. And she so you knew her all your life? Yes. Yes. Ashby's oldest citizen. Right. But the Cain, when, she turned, or when we turned the cane back in, uh, I guess Lina Perna got it. And yes. Lina Perna and my mother-in-law were friends. Uh -huh. Finnish people again. Yes, yes. Well, is your wife is Finnish also? Yes. Right? Yes. Very good. Well, uh, any particular humorous things happened to you in the, in the Navy? Uh, it, uh, I wouldn't what say exceptionally of? humorous or anything that would make a history of it. I mean, everybody has something happen to them. But Oh, you said something about a basketball injury, on which, by the way, I'm going to go back. You were on that famous basketball team in Ashby, weren't you? Yes. Yes, that was in 1946. 46. That was, we've had a couple of others. We had interviewed Bob Gumrus and talked about that uh, basketball team. Do you have anything you want to tell us about, uh, about that? Uh, other than we felt really honored about it, and we've had many pictures, even though we had a, uh, my 50th re reunion, George Johnson, he's since passed away, he took a picture of the, what was left there and they, they published it in the Townsend Times apparently. And, I mean, at, at that time that was history. It was history. Because you, you, you know, a small town like this and we went to towns and we took on what we call the big boys and we beat them. So yeah. it's something in our, our life that we remember always. It's very much a treasure and we have a picture of that team right there in the Historical Society and all of your names are on it and uh, everybody can see it. And, and the amazing thing is how you practiced and learned in the building which is now the Grange. <laughs> and, and part of the last Wednesday of the month is St. Paul's Masonic Temple but the Grange Hall was our basketball floor. Right. And when you, I don't know if you have, have seen it, when it was when we played basketball with the register in the middle of the floor, the boards on each end of the wall, which was not a basketball uh, backboard, which you see nowadays, it was just nailed to the wall. So you had to learn how to play basketball with the ball there, because the others that come in couldn't do it. So that's how we were able to win in Ashby. Of course, it didn't have, hurt to have, sometimes we had my wife's uncle, a referee. <laughs> wasn't my wife at that time, but... He knew the whole family. So when you came back uh, from the service, uh, what did you uh, and your wife, you moved here to Ashby then, did you? Well, we lived in Fitchburg for about a year. Okay. Well, maybe a little over here because we moved into the house where we live right now in 1955. And we've been in the same house ever since. Do you, and what, uh, what work did you go into then? And when I uh, moved to Ashby, well, uh, I w went to American Can. I had a couple other jobs in between, but nothing. But I went to American National Can in Fitchburg, and I was employed there for 39 years until they locked the doors on all of us in, in 1991. 1991, American Can. Was that on Airport Road? Yes. Yes. Still vacant, isn't it? No. At uh, KC Plastics took it over shortly. And they were trying to subdivide it into a couple of shops, but then uh, KC Plastics is still there. But when Fitchburg changed their bus routes with students to first pupil or something like that, Laidlaw took over that building and, and they property to park the buses. So you have two bus companies right opposite each other. One, Laidlaw still has a lot of the bus routes in Fitchburg and the area you see a Laidlaw bus come up to Ashby once in a while. But the first bus people is that they took over the Fitchburg contract. And I don't know what you've been by there at the end of the day. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of buses down there. There are. All the same color. <laughs> right. So, uh, not knowing too much about American Can, what was the manufacturer? What, uh, what did they make? Well, the, they, were, they were known for making Dixie cups. Because originally, American Can was Dixie Cowdery on. Uh, 
down back at MCM in Fitchburg, then they built the plant down on that it was known as Dixie County when we moved in 19, I would say about 1955 because I was moving that plant down to Airport Road while I was moving from Fitchburg to Ashby. Oh. So it was 1955, then it was changed to American Can, then American National Can, and that was known as that. There's still one plant out in Chicago. Oh, there is. So it, is, it was a company not, that had other... other uh... No, they, they still... They, you can still buy a Dixie cup. I don't know where they make... They must subcontract to make the cup out of it. But with any kind of packaging machine we also made, we made a big, what they call a toothpaste machine that had the roll like the crisp toothpaste. That's the roll that come in. You come into the machine as a piece of, just like you're taking out a roll of uh, toilet paper if you want, and they, uh, it formed itself on different parts of the machine. It filled it, it capped it, and it was ready to go out. It was a big machine, and that was one of the, at the end, one of their biggest products. But they made, they made, yeah, for Coca-Cola company, they made the cans. They didn't fill them, but they just made the, the can to be filled, and then it was sealed wherever they put that. So all kinds of packaging products. A Dixie cup was the <laughs> trademark. Because you still buy Dixie cups, so I don't know who makes them, but they still got that, that name on it. So. Uh -huh. right. And you, what was the original company, you say Dixie? Dixie Cowdery. Dixie Cowdery. And well, is, was it a Lemonster company, or was this part of another group? What, what do you mean? Uh, no, there was no other part of, in this area. Dixie Cowdery and American National Camp were all by itself. Hmm. The only closest place for here grew in the height of it was down in Needham, Mass. They had another plant down there, but that closed up long before, long before we did it. Yeah. <clears throat> but I felt good that I served 39 years in one place without I, moving around. Yes. Boy, you don't find that much anymore. No. The younger generation, the grass is always greener. Right. Or else the jobs change. I, you know. And I felt bad for the younger ones. I get very close friends that were 10, 15 years younger, even younger than that. I felt bad for them because now they had to go out, start all over. They lost a lot of their benefits and stuff like that. But I was at an age I could just wait a little bit and collect my social security and pension. I mean, it didn't hurt me as much as the rest of them. There was seven of us that fell into that category where we yeah. could retire. So. But you are doing some part-time work now. I'm a security guard at the Pittsburgh Art Museum. Oh, really? Are yeah. you? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's, that's I, a I nice work job. like I'm going in today. When I get through here, and well, I go in for 12, and I work. I never know how many hours I work, but it's not many. It's a four-hour shift, so. But it's it's a comfortable job. It's an easy job. It's right. well, inside. It's a nice job. And there's a lot of nice people come there that you meet. So it's not been an exciting life up until January 13th, 2003. Well, it has been a way. I had three grandchildren. They lived in New Hampshire with my daughter and son-in-law. In June of this year, uh, past year, they decided they're going to change their environment, and they went to Jacksonville, Florida. That's where they are right now. They are both uh, in teaching progression. My son-in-law is a principal down there. My daughter is in early childhood development. Hopefully one day we'll fly down to see them if they don't move back up here. They're already showing signs of sick homelessness. Oh. Sickness. <laughs> well, Anne Hayes here is a native Floridian. Absolutely. Where about? Sanford. See, my wife has a niece in Florida. Her cousin is in Florida half the time, half some are up here and the rest of it down there. We have a girl down there, she's in her 50s now, but it's where her adopted parents, you remember Richie Wilkerson? Mm -hmm. The Wilkerson family, Sherry Wilkerson? Right. Well, she's married and she's down there and we're in contact when she comes up here, she always visits us. She calls us her adopted mother and father, but Gladys and Richie passed away, so we've been in close contact with them. We have other, my wife's got an aunt in Florida and another nephew in Florida to the, we got places to go and things to do if we ever get there. 
Now, how many children do you say? Three. Not my children. I have two. You have two. I have and a one daughter. is in Florida, and where's the other one? He lives in Fitchburg. Oh, in Fitchburg. He's, he's an optician for an optometrist in Westford. He's been an well, he tried to go in the computer field, but then it was so crowded at that point in time, he wanted a change in his direction too, so he went to Witty in Worcester and took up the optical course, and he was very, very successful in that. In the school, he got high honors there, he got recommendations, and he worked for, for Dr. Solney, who was then Dr. Borgo for quite a while, got contact with this Dr. Friedman through other people in Westford, and he's still there, and he likes it. Bill, let me bring you back to your war experiences. Do you remember as a young man before you went into the service, you had a couple of years there when you probably were out of school, and can you remember the mood of the country? Can you remember the personal uh, things that your family did? Did you save your, you know, buy war bonds and save your tinfoil and all that stuff? Do you Tell me what you remember of your pre- Navy days before leaving well, your enlistment. Things that I like before I went there. And I would like to know what effect the war at that time had on you and how you ever felt. Did you ever feel there was the possibility that we might lose the war? What was the general feeling that you remember as a pre pre Navy?